Welcome everybody. Um, in the world of COVID, um, we, uh, we do all kinds of things that are different these days to connect to the people we care about, keep the arts alive, to keep our souls alive and all the rest of it as you go. So thanks to, uh, to Jaffrey for supporting the art all the way around. Um, in our time tonight, um, obviously I wanna spend time sharing with you some of the images that you just saw through a video up up close and personal through my screen and uh, talk a few stories about different things about them. Um, as we go, we'll start with a little Zoom basics, but it seems like we got a crew that probably has beyond the basics. And then I just broke up our time together as my, my thoughts of philosophy as nature photography, as art, as uh, therapy for my soul, uh, as getting out to, uh, to appreciate nature and wildlife and the rest of it and then have little sections to highlight that, landscapes, wildlife. And we'll take you on brief trips to Costa Rica that we've recently gone with my buddy, Mark Emmerman in Africa with my buddy, Mark Bierman, uh, as we go. Most importantly, as we go through the process I, I, is if you have any questions and thoughts, I'll try to uh, promote you to get engaged from time to time. I know that some people don't like to talk on these things Others might want to put something in the chat if you know. So the more engaged you are, probably the more interesting the stories are. Um, and then, uh, you know, what do you want me to emphasize? There are lots of aspects of the process. Uh, Becca actually highlighted two that I might not highlight as much, which is uh, what's my post-processing work? And then were there different textures on, uh, on, on the uh, canvases? The answer to the second question, Becca, was, Yes, that one had a slightly different texture. You can get uh, prints on canvas and get uh, different type of textures uh, as you go. On the aluminum work, just to kind of uh, highlight that question, on the aluminum, you get choices of basically a, a white background or a neutral one. Some of it pops more than others. Uh, so just like photographic paper over the years has given us so many options on what to texture and print on, we do have multiple options, certainly not as many um, on printing on canvas um, and, the, and the rest. I've been starting off for the last three, three years with the same kind of idea, but um, to those of you who are, uh, who are managing day to day, which is most people, but in particular my colleagues in the education world, uh, in the medical world, in the get things delivered to people world, et cetera, appreciate your balancing it all in this era of COVID. Most of you know my work is mostly in the schools. I'm trying to move into retirement and wildlife and outdoors seems like a good place for, for me and Amy to spend our time and to do that particular work. So I'm particularly um, passionate about education. My whole, my whole life I've been there and I just worry about all of you out there in school. Stay well, parents, hard on you too. So thanks for balancing it all. This was one of my snowy owls this year who landed on this rock. And sometimes you just have to, uh, to balance things real closely. Um, I know most of you are probably familiar with Zoom, but just in case, I think if you found a way to either keep your video off if you don't wanna be seen or on, you know how to do that by clicking on that video. The most important thing you seem to have mastered is mostly stay on mute, particularly if you've got some radio or TV or, or something else in the background so that we don't get that kind of feedback um, as we go. Feel free to, um, to unmute yourself and ask a question uh, at any time. I did put up the chat box. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, if you wanna chat a question in or any kind of feedback or whatever, obviously for those of you who are interested in emojis and reactions, you probably know the emoji and reaction things that are there. Fortunately, they're all ethical and allowable in public schools, including the raise your hand button as we go. So right now, I just wanted to say, um, add my blessings to the snowy owl visitors coming down from the, uh, from the north this year. We've had uh, an amazing winter. We call it an eruption. Um, you know, most of us are familiar with migrations, natural movement of animals from one place to another because of feeding grounds, et cetera, um, and food sources, et cetera. Uh, but our owls come down, juveniles, this time of year, and an eruption is when you have an, an irregular pattern. We're more than usual, and we're experiencing a pretty amazing uh, 
array of snowy owls that keep getting moved around by the storms. And, and just when we get to know them and love them and figure out where they are, we get another opportunity to move around. So uh, we're also getting a chance, I am, to photograph northern harrier hawks. These birds are impossible. They, they've been on my nemesis list for years. And all of a sudden, um, I believe they sent down from the Arctic, just like the snowies, these harriers that have more social emotional learning skills. They're females and they come close. They let you get close. They're not afraid of people. Usually harriers dart in and out, whatever. Some people say, you know, how do you get these photographs? I think that was one of your questions. A lot of times it's when preparation meets patience and persistence. Patience means staying on a spot for a while and waiting. Persistence to me means going back time and time again. Even if you got a good shot, there's always a chance for another shot. Preparation, of course, making sure you know the animal behavior. And then there's a whole lot of prayers and luck uh, involved uh, as well. But the more opportunities you have, the more practice you have, you know, uh, it's a skill. And as I've uh, talked about my whole life in terms of education and special education, if it's a skill, it can be taught. And, uh, and apparently uh, I'm getting better, I'm learning a little bit. So it's been a great winter through those, uh, those birds and others as we go. Some of you may you know, care about the equipment. So I put one slide in and if you have any questions um, about equipment, it's, uh, you know, it's here for you to, to go. I use um, a Nikon, a D850 a digital camera. Um, I carry when I go mostly on trips, I carry two bodies, one to accommodate my largest zoom, which is a 500 millimeter. I do have a teleconverter. That's a mechanism where you put it on and it increases that five to a 700. And I also use a 7200. You can see all of the lenses there. Most people aren't that interested in the lenses and the, and the rest of it as we go. Thanks to my friend Mark Fontaine for catching a picture of me with two of my loves, both the camera and the Yankee hat. Sorry for you uh, Boston Red Sox fans out there. Any thoughts, questions about uh, equipment that anybody has at this, uh, at this moment? Just uh, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in with a question or come back to it at another, uh, at another time. Um, if, I, um, if I'm prepared enough for one more link, I think that link would take you to um, my website. So just to let you know that I've got a website called Chasing the Golden Light, uh, chasingthegoldenlight.com. There is a, as you open it up, a slideshow that kind of takes you through my take on pictures and slides. And then if you scroll down, there are a number of galleries. And if you like snowy owls, you can go to snowy owls or Kenya or Costa Rica. So just to give you a, a heads up, uh, that there's a website out there that you can look at at your leisure uh, and go to at any time. All right. I don't want to put a can of her on, but the technology seems to be working okay tonight. Is it working out there for you? Or have you all gone to sleep already? I'm wide awake and I love it. And it's working very well, very smooth. Thank you, Rohan. All right. Got it. All right. So, um, can't talk about wildlife and nature without at least a little bit about ethics or minimal impact. So I'm not sure I, I didn't need to read all five of these big ideas for you. Um, but, you know, um, I try to, we, we, you know, we can't, you know, to say that we uh, don't influence an animal totally, these animals can see forever. They can hear, you know, snowy owls can hear rodents underneath the snow, you know, under a foot of snow. And so, you know, of course they're going to see us, but my job is to try to have as minimal impact, don't change their behavior to respect private property, et cetera, around it. So um, that's my hope. You know, I'm a human being and sometimes I err, um, but I try um, to live up to that as we go. Um, as a teacher, I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, mandated to try to engage you a little bit um, in terms of what you might have come to, uh, to emphasize today. But I guess I'd start off by the, this thought about what makes a, a good photograph. I've already gave you a, a prompt uh, in one way or another. Anyone want to jump in with, you know, when, or, or a piece of art? Because I see photography and fine art um, and painting, et cetera, and sketching and drawing as the same. 
what 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 uh, draws you to an image? Anybody? The photographer. <laughs> <laughs> Howard. Yes. Can you hear me? I can. My mentor is jumping in as a teacher. What draws you to an image, Linda? Howard, the colors in your photographs are just, I don't have words to describe them. They are just mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. and, and I could look at them forever. It's almost like meditating. Mm. So good images, really, um, one of the things that draws you in is, is color you know, in that way. And boy, color can be spectacular and uh, in different ways. And nature makes amazing color. And yes, in terms of post-processing, my job is to bring out the best of what color was there um, in that particular way. So yeah, um, you know, I mean, there are times I look out and I take my camera out and I go, no one's going to believe the color in that picture. I'm going to have to desaturate it because people are going to think I saturated it. Right? Have, you, have you ever seen a sunset or a sunrise or whatever where you look at that color and you go, that is about as saturated as I, and when you go, nobody's going to believe that that, you know, that was what it looked like that morning, but it was, it's amazing. So yeah, so color can really draw you in in that particular way. What else? Howie, yeah. Else? Hi, Howie. Um, I, I think in a lot of your photographs, you're, you're capturing a moment. Mm. So getting a story, capturing a moment. And by the way, this wasn't about my photographs. This was what makes a great photograph in different ways. Thank you for your feedback in that sense of it. But yes, a, a good piece of art and certainly a, a, a nature and wildlife photographer in particular, right, is trying to capture a moment. But so are painters, right? Um, so are sketchers, you know, so are, uh, you know, other sculptors, et cetera. Okay. All right. So telling a story, wooing us with color. Anybody want to add a couple more things? Sense Sorry. of light. Light, Michelle? No, capturing a sense of life. A sense of life. Yes, the yes. subject, the story, a sense of life. I met Michelle in Costa Rica uh, on a trail once. Some, that's another part about nature and wildlife photography. You get to meet great people and, and uh, do interesting things. Good. Hi, was there somebody else who wanted to jump in? I was saying the subject matter. Subject matter, strong subject matter, part of telling the story as you go. Excellent. All right, so I broke it down like the Miller commercial tastes great, less filling, you know, that kind of thing in terms of a beer into technically correct uh, and emotionally compelling. So, you know, again, I agreed with you about strong subject, you know, in terms of photography or, or even painting or whatever, as we say, the compelling light for me, you know, there's sometimes it's just beautiful sky and I'll like it, but other times where that light is even more magical in different ways. You want a good composition and that's where I feel like, personally, I feel landscape compositions are, are hard. Wildlife photography is about a lot of technical stuff, knowing the bird, putting yourself in the right position, basic photography, questions about getting it. But then in that moment, it's really about boom, 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 I think, and, and being in the best position to be able to manage a fast animal sometimes, sometimes a slower animal at that speed. Landscapes take a different skill set. They need to see the four corners of things and differently. So that composition comes into play in my landscape more than my uh, wildlife. Of course, it comes in, in in all things. Proper exposure makes sense and sharp most of the time, sometimes blurred to show emotion. It also has to be emotionally compelling, uh, appealing, compelling, whatever in that particular way. And so the best image is one that, that draws you into it, makes a connection, uh, leaves you with a story, something to the imagination. So those are my thoughts about it. Um, and by no means do I now ask you to say that my photographs are great by any means and, and appreciate them, but that's what I strive for in terms of trying uh, to do the best. When I compose an image, I ask myself a simple question. People have been asking me a lot about helping them process now, but a lot of it is, is about composing. I ask myself in that image, 
is it, when I crop, because that's the first way to compose is cropping as a photographer, right? In that way, as a painter, you decide what your edges are in that way. Um, as a drawer, you decide your edges. I crop, which is, is it something that's going to improve the picture or distract from it? Simple question um, around things as well. All right, in order to engage you even more, see, as long as I have my mentor, I have to use teaching skills to get, and you guys have been doing great checking in and whatever, so I know you're not asleep. If you're willing to play along at the end of tonight, I'd like you to give me what you think are your favorites, right? And you don't have to all do them, whatever, we won't ask everyone, but let me know which ones you felt were as technically correct or emotionally compelling as possible. <coughs> For me, the first, the first thing is to photograph what you love. That, that really matters in, in different kinds of ways. From, from, you know, I grew up on 93rd Street and Broadway. My friend Steve Saul and Kathy Saul are, are on tonight in that way. Also grew up on the Upper West Side. Um, and and um, ultimately, um, once I got out of New York City, nature drew me to it. I drew me to hiking and walking and mountains and, and, and always to, to animals. I was always searching for where's that deer or elk or bear or whatever. And now at, at 65, I get opportunities to see those things up close uh, in that way. Uh, Ansel Adams, of course, you know, speaks to all of us, I think, <laughs> photography again. So photograph what you love make that in the expression be uh, what you want in that image. I've always wanted to see baby uh, bear cups uh, and uh, got a chance to do that as well. Um, you know, also a photograph. This is, this is one um, which, I, which has surprised me over the years of my wildlife photography. Um, I've shot bear pictures and, you know, there are some when there's a bear you'll see with a salmon in its mouth and other things in those bear cubs. I love those. And this one, I liked it when I took it. Well, it's my best seller over the years. It's, it's been compelling to people more than it was compelling to me, which also points out why photography and art are individual matters. One thing could look great to somebody and not so good to another. And, and that's it. We have personal preferences. But this particular picture has, has spoken to a lot of people. I always try to ask them why they like this one, you know, not more than others, but whatever. And most of the time it's about a story. It's, it's more than just the bear, it's the storm. It's the looking away. Some of them talk about how you're underneath it, you know, in that sense of it. I often now look at it and say, it would make for a good children's book cover. Anybody has a story out there as we go, so. Black Bear and Storm. Of course, you know, anytime you're lucky enough as a wildlife photographer to get um, interactions between uh, animals and, uh, and their cubs and things. I mean, so for me, finding wildlife, particularly mammals and having these opportunities has been amazing. Being able to see an Alaskan lynx. Um, most of my work, I don't do this, which is to I made this black and white, obviously, and kept the natural eye color of the eyes in there. Um, I, I've only done that maybe two or three times uh, to play with uh, things as we go. So here's an example. Like when I got this shot, I was really excited, et cetera, uh, in that way. Had that around as we go um, from my trip to Katmai uh, National Park. I was recently uh, fortunate in, uh, to go to, to the Tetons. I haven't been to the Tetons since I was in my 20s. I can't believe it took me 40 years to get back there. What an amazing place because it combines my two loves, landscape and mountains and great outdoors with animals. And what a, what a perfect morning to be driving down the road, to be going to, uh, to try to get to Yellowstone and two of these bulls out right where you'd want them. I, if I wanted to, you know, one of the things when I do trips, I'm sure that most of you might do it too. Maybe, in, you know, maybe I'm obsessed and compulsive about the things, but I, I have in my mind a handful of images that I want from my trips and, you know, and they're classics or not classics or whatever. And, and of course, one has got to be some kind of big animal in front of the Tetons, you know, in good light in the morning. So felt blessed. By the way, stop me at any time around an image or ask a question or a thought. Is there anything yet? Anybody wants to chime in on? Yes. 
Thanks to my, you know, sometimes again, one of the questions that was asked me to, you know, you're saying people back, I've been asking, how do you get the opportunities? Well, you know, a lot of it is how we get lots of opportunities, which are, which is our friends, <laughs> uh, you know, and whether our friends call me up as in this case and said, the day before I'm going to Costa Rica with 17 things on a to-do list, you got to get up here now. There's a fox den I just found underneath an abandoned house. And there's like four kits and both mom and dad. And like, I'm in the car in 10 minutes or whatever, or, you know, uh, ebird.com to find certain locations or, you know, email lists or Google groups, you get all of it. So this is a buddy called me up and boy, to be able to, to, to get, you know, obviously shots like this, this one's special to me because it seems, it feels like it has it. It has, does it have enough color for you, Linda? Uh, it, yes, it does. But yeah. these, these, the, the, the kind of the mother and child, I'm an animal lover and it just, yeah, when you get fills a shot, my heart to see the, the connections and how you've captured, you've captured the, the connections between these animals, it's, uh, it's really remarkable. Yeah. And so I feel any, looking any, up. anytime you get this, you feel blessed. And obviously yeah. there were shots be <clears throat> before this where, is that forsythia, that yellow stuff? I'm not a flower person. This stuff makes me sneeze. Uh, and stuff like <laughs> that. I don't like, I don't like it except in, in a photograph. Yeah, well, but, obviously they were playing on a different angle and you try to make, so there's another thing. I, I can't put it in the, I'm not a painter. I can't put it in. And also I'm not someone who's going to Photoshop in the yellow flowers behind the foxes, right? I'm not going to do that. At least not yet. You know, talk to me in 10 years. We'll see if I'm interested in that, but I'm not interested <laughs> in that now in that way. So I'm always waiting, looking for, is there a better angle? My friend, Mark Bierman's always teaching me with, you know, keep that, keep moving angles, make sure that. And then finally, when it walked in front of this yellow bush, I was like, shaken okay and then when it looked up so yeah these moments are are few and far between but i'm fortunate enough what i say to people is you don't see the other twenty thousand shots i shot in africa that are now in the delete section and being you know cleaned out of my computer system uh yeah and this one has the composition to me and, and, and other things yep awesome wonderful yeah and then similarly this one posed i was waiting we, we, this spot, we, that spot I just share with you, I got once for, a, for basically two and a half hours and then had to go to Costa Rica. And then, but I was blessed. Sometimes you just get blessed. This one, the spot we found up near new London was, I got there maybe four or five times and always these kits would come across the street, which saddened me. One eventually got hit, which maybe saddened me even worse. Fortunately, oh. I didn't see it. Um, but they kept going over this hill and out into the water and I kept saying to Mark, you know, one of these days, I hope one of them is going to walk across that mound and instead of walking right across, sit there and stop for a second so I can get a picture. And sure enough, it, that happened, 90 degree angle, et cetera, et cetera, to get it. Now, I will tell you this, when I looked in my image, because I wasn't using auto ISO that would adjust the ISO shot to deal with the rest of those things. It was very dark and I used post-processing and I got this, it almost looks like shot in a studio. It makes me crazy. This looks like I, <laughs> I went into some studio and said, okay, here's my son's graduation shot. Just put a background up, you know, and shoot it. Yeah. All right. Well, by the way, we only got through the mammals so far. I'm going to have to move faster and tell less stories. All right, Africa. How, how, What's that? Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, I can see. I have a question for you. Yeah. Like those last couple of shots you were just talking about. Yeah. How far away are you from the animals? Because obviously if you are close, they're going to run away. No question. Are you at a, yeah. How far away yeah. are you in a lot of shots? So most of the time I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, what we would consider far away across the street to use a New York City kind of analogy, you know, or across the road or whatever. I've got a 500 millimeter lens. Technically, the eye sees about 50 millimeters. So 10 times the, the distance is going to collapse 
Plus then if I add that one four, I'm now at 700. So yes, I'm a way, and then I'm cropping. I've got a large sensor. So I'm using all the tools at my disposal, a telephoto lens, a large sensor so that even if I crop, so if I start with 24 megapixel and this is now only five megapixel, it still could be printed and looks good as opposed to a camera that has four megapixel or eight. Does that make sense, Steve? Yeah. Around it. So both yeah. things are happening. The distance in the lenses, 25 yards, 50 yards, whatever at most in that way for the others. Yeah, and ultimately, and, and you know what we found? That certain animals, you know, like this year, the Harriers, as I mentioned, they don't care, they come close. Most of the time, the animals will react, but they give you the distance they're comfortable. And of course, who would have thought I finally had a dream come true, got to, to Africa, just like my dream in Costa Rica, and was able, I pictured in my head, I wanna see a leopard, I wanna see a leopard, the big cats or whatever. I know I'll see a lion, but leopard. And all of a sudden we come around a corner and the Jeep hadn't seen one yet. And look in a tree, by the way, um, I, I don't have it here, Steve, but I can share it or show you on the website. I have the picture at my eyesight of how far away it looked. And you almost couldn't mm -hmm. see this leopard in the tree just using my eyes, no binoculars, whatever. But then we got a little closer and whatever. But there were times in Africa when this leopard and lions got within 50 feet of me where I had to like say, okay, am I going to use the iPhone right now? Uh, you know, even the 70 millimeters. So sometimes they get close. Obviously this boy who is now enjoying his hippopotamus meal, you can see a full belly there. The next morning is basically, uh, you know, far away as I could get, but we never felt threatened and worried. This was one of the three big bad boys in the Mara that we went to. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes if I hustle. I also have loved eagles and birds and other kinds of things and have been fortunate enough to photograph eagles. Now, now this nest is a hundred, this nest is probably a hundred feet in the air, Steve, in addition to being 50 yards away, but I use all that power of the technology and, and I'm able to get shots. And then with some post-processing, there are tools that help sharpen that and make it uh, make it tighter too. So all of that, you know, you know, there are three aspects to photography, preparation, taking the pictures, and then post-processing. And all three are important. Was so fortunate with those eaglets that they landed on the ground in the cemetery. Always picture, oh, I need American flags and bald eagles. Well, only thing more perfect than this would have been an adult on the ground there with that. Um, in that way, this one was so close, Steve, it had a rabbit underneath it. You can't see it in this shot. And it flew wow. right at me with the rabbit. I said, no, I didn't order any takeout. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> love eagles, no matter where they are. These are battalier eagles. They're beautiful eagles that we found in Costa Rica. And of course, um, you know, birds of prey in other forms like this osprey and this chick. Um, you know, the strangest places. This is, in a, this is in a little strip mall in Nashua, New Hampshire, in a light fixture. This osprey's come back twice in a row, um, you know. And so there you go, not scared of humans. In, in a Howard? Park, in a parking lot, yeah. You hearing me? I am. So when you talk about shooting at those kinds of long distances that Steve asked about, yes. let's not overlook the value of the tripod technician. Absolutely. Talk about that for a minute. What do you mean by the tripod technician? Well, Howard is busy with his two cameras at any moment. Um, he needs somebody to help haul the tripod and make <laughs> sure that he gets a, it in a place um, where he could shoot what he's trying to get far away at great distances. And that keeps changing. So the tripod tech has to stay on their feet, has to anticipate uh... what's the next shot. And it's an often overlooked technique. Yeah, overlooked, that helps add particularly to been used in Costa Rica. Um, you know, Steve Saul might have might have filled that position twenty years ago, Mark, but you did fill that position in Costa Rica. Yes, yes. And by the way, I thought it was somebody else asking. Don't forget about the tripod, and the tripod is important for these pictures to use. But the technicians more more important because without the technician, you don't have the tripod. 
one of my first snowy owls um, that I photographed and fell in love with years ago. And now they're coming back to the coast, as we said, in, a, in an eruption uh, year uh, as we go through that process. These were original shots back, back in like about six years ago at Rye. By the way, I finally found one at Rye in a uh, day before yesterday, or was it yesterday? Yeah, in the last couple of days back at Rye, New Hampshire, where they hadn't been for a while. Um, and then, you know, a, a picture that I've always looked for a snowy in the snow. This one sold uh, multiple times recently for me at, at the, uh, the New Hampshire, the New Hampshire uh, uh, Association and other places uh, as we as we go. I'm not I'm not as risky a driver to drive out to the seacoast in snowstorms as I used to be when I was younger. So the opportunities for snowy in the snow are less frequent uh, as we go. Um, you know, this great gray owl is one of my favorite shots. I hear from Becca that it actually was purchased um, out of the uh, gallery in Jaffrey. So thank you to whoever bought this one on metal from the gallery in the last couple of days. Uh, I have other copies of it, as you might imagine, as a photographer in different ways. But to me, this was like one of my, my favorite shots because, first of all, the great gray owl, which while it also lives in the Canadian forests and up more north, not quite as far as the tundra, perhaps, or maybe some in there, and seen in the northwest, like Oregon and Washington State and in Minnesota and places like that, only visits New England every 15 years. And, uh, and so a few years ago, it made its way to Newport, New Hampshire. Fortunate for me, it was about two minutes from the high school that I worked at, or worked consulted with Newport High School, so I could combine a little work with multiple trips. So this animal stayed for six weeks, got to learn its behavior, where it liked to hunt, where, and so was able to put my, myself one day in position, although there were other days that it didn't work, but in position between its perch spot and where it hunted for voles with the light coming right at it and over my shoulder. And it went between me and another photographer. I could not hear it um, at all. It, they, their wings are obviously, they're silent flyers, all these owls, but I did feel the breeze. And that was quite a, quite a moment um, in different kinds of ways. The great gray owl of Newport, New Hampshire is like a legend uh, as we go. Love owls of any sort, barred owls, barred owls flying. Barred owls kissing new fledglings. By the way, I have seen now, I've been fortunate enough to see four or five barred owls come out of cavities and fledge in the last few years. And almost always when mom kisses you, the baby cuddles and is interested. This, this one was like a teenager right out of the chute. Could care less, hop to different places. Mom flew over, try to kiss it again. Very, very, very not, not uh, what's the right word? What am I trying to say? Not appreciative of mom at all, this particular <laughs> youngster. Sometimes you, you get lucky and four, you get four of a kind. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've never seen four screech owl babies since or, or after that particular moment underneath those leaves hiding. Pretty incredible, whatever. I also like landscape. By the way, that was the wildlife, what I like. I like landscapes too. And uh, this, this particular one has special meaning. Um, in Sugar Hill, New Hampshire, obviously there are lots of lupins in the spring. They happen around Father's Day. And so made it a habit with Nathan and Amy most years to go up real early. Now you have to get there at sunrise because I'm trying to get a beautiful sunrise and lupins in bloom and get in those days a teenage kid up at two o'clock in the morning so we could be there at 4.30. By the way, part of preparation <laughs> is 40 minutes before the sun rises. Some of the best light is 20, 30 minutes before the sun rises. So you need to be set up with tripod man. Those were the hardest tripod man days, right? Because it's really the sunrise work, Immerman, that you had to do that you charged extra for, I believe, because you had to get up so early for, the, for those shots. So this year, you know, some years the sunrise beautiful, but the lupin are wilted or not so good. Other years they're not blooming, but there's no, and then a few years back, got fortunate enough to get both the sunrise, the mountains, and the lupin. So photograph what you love too, landscapes, I love it. Sun, a sunset, kayaks in Lake Massabesic. Fortunate enough, this was the craziest light I'd ever seen. Went to Mount Monadnock to shoot Monadnock, which is on the left in Perkins Pond, 
with a buddy of mine. The light was not so good. Blah, coming from behind. We're about to pack up. And the next thing you know, we look to the right and, and the sky's on fire. Unfortunately, it wasn't in front of Monadnock, a little to the left, but we'll still take it. It was beautiful, crazy light that day. You know, and that's what I mean about light. Like here, light is good. The light up on the top of the mountain makes this picture more compelling to me um, than others uh, as we go in that particular way uh, as well. So photograph what you like. And go often. I, I go to this spot, I would say 15, 20 times a year um, because it's a spot that, that's significant. And most of the time, I don't even take my camera out, um, but other times I do. Sometimes I get lucky. I'm photographing an eagle nest in front of me um, right before dawn and there's not enough light. And I go, when's the sun coming up? And I turn around and this, this is in front of me. That's, by the way, when you need the second camera because the 500 lens would show you the top of one of those trees in the house. You need the wide angle lens in this particular case, right, to be able to get it. Um, one of my techniques for my work is, it's called the four corners. Um, I always wanna try in that cropping to get compositions to look. Now it's not always there, but I always ask myself, you know, have I done the best? So after I ask, is it necessary? Does it add or distract? I then ask, you know, are my corners covered? Do I have a good foreground and the rest of it? Um, this was a winter sunrise. And then sometimes you just get those magical skies at a classic New England barn, you know, red barn, white snow. That's of course also. So a number of those images of course are, um, are at, the, uh, at the center themselves as you go. So photograph those things and, you know, and then when you go away, keep going back to that place um, you know, by the way, I think there was also an extra charge Emmerman, for the tripod carrying if you got your feet wet. It's all these <laughs> surcharges, I think. You get your feet wet and you got to walk out into the water with me like that uh, as well. But I'm not sure about that. Was that true? Maybe, maybe not. Well, maybe you know, that was you no talk charge. about prepper, prepper, sorry, we're over talking. You, you talk about preparation for the camera, but it's also preparation for what you're going to encounter on the ground. So it's the type of shoes that you wear when you're going towards the ocean. See? The man's well prepared. That's why he does tour bands all over the world. All right. And then sometimes you just kind of wait for the sunrises and sunsets to kind of happen. And, you know, uh, in that way, I'm a sucker for sunrises and sunsets because Linda of color. <laughs> all right. He's, by the way, color alone doesn't do it. You need composition, you need foreground, you need something in my mind. But color is important, right? In a, in a, in a photograph, end of the day, at Amboseli National Park uh, with a lone zebra. And that, that I think it's Acadia, something like that tree. Amazing when we, uh, in Africa and Kenya, uh, the sunrises and sunsets. And of course, I never forgot my roots when I went to the Tetons trying to do landscapes and, and capture the mountains in that way. I also like lighthouses. I know it's not necessarily nature and some people are pure you know, they call it hand of person, you know, there's no hand of person in it, but I love the interaction between lighthouses and skies. And this was an amazing day where Amy and I, I was, was a tennis player before all my body uh, kind of went on me. And uh, our, our team at Hampshire Hills got to the, uh, the next level, which was uh, whatever it was, regionals <laughs> in uh, Portland. And we went up there and Amy went with us and we stayed in Portland and it was our anniversary. So before the tennis match at sunrise, we went out to photograph and this, this was the scene we got. Some of you believe in God, some serendipity, but wasn't that perfect for an anniversary present to be able to get this scene with Amy with me that morning was pretty amazing in that way. Penaquib Lighthouse, you know, just an amazing lighthouse that I loved in that perspective. And of course, near us, we get uh, moody nubble in a pretty blue light, cool blue lights in the snow time. So I photograph what I love and a lot of them are lighthouses. And sometimes you get it perfect. You know where that moon's coming up. There are tools for that. I'm not yet good at those apps yet. I'll get better at them. Um, but it came up right at the sun, at, when the sun was going down and the light turned purple. And it was pretty amazing to capture that. I did saturate it. Yes, I did add saturation, but uh, I did not change the color um, in other ways. So those, that's kind of what I love. So 
ultimately that first piece of it, I love wildlife and landscape and that's what I do. I'll, I'll stop for a moment for questions or thoughts. And then I have two, the, the, the end is I have two little tell a story cause that's part of what I do. So I have some pictures from Costa Rica and from Africa um, as well that I thought I'd share with you uh, past that introduction which I will do at a little bit faster speed since we got about 15 minutes left, but um, I'm willing to also to hang on a little bit later too, if, uh, if that ended up working. Thoughts, questions, reactions on anything so far? And nobody even asked how much you got paid. Look at that, Mark. So that makes sense to me. That's good. What do you got there, Steve? How, or, I was going to actually suggest that you put tripod person or man, whatever, whatever. Credit. Out, Give him out credit. Competitive, out to competitive bidding so that other people can have an opportunity to do that as well. No, no, this is pure nepotism is how I operate my <laughs> Pure nepotism. My friends and family <laughs> get all the jobs. You know how many people have asked me, could I go in your suitcase with you to Africa? And I'm I one ask, of them. Are you friends and family? I say no. Yeah. Are you are you my mentor from Buff State? And then no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sorry. Are you in my art pro club in Manchester? No. Uh, you know, are you my friend from high school? No. Otherwise, that's how we do it as we go. So welcome to Costa Rica. I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker. So in this section, again, remember, you were kind of trying to remember which one you liked the best because I'm going to ask you if there were any. And by the way, if you didn't like any of them, you don't have to say any of that either. But uh, so this I'm just going to go through with less story because of time. But feel free to ask a question about it. And of course, most of the people know me say, ha ha, you'll never get through it without a story uh, in that particular way. Hi, Karen and Val. Good to see you too out there. So, I mean, Costa Rica landscape, beautiful. This is a multi-shot panorama. I think it's probably five images merged together. The new technology of camera will do that too, pretty amazingly. Uh, obviously your iPhone will do it as well. Um, and then again, if you, if you need any of the facts about Costa Rica yeah, um, in that particular, what's amazing is how much biodiversity it has and how many birds and animals. It's such a beautiful place. Um, without spending a lot of time, I did go to these six places if you have questions or thoughts about that, but, uh, but they were you know, a combination of Pacific coastal spots and coastal spots down by Hako three and four, and then into the mountains into five and six. Most of you heard about Monteverde perhaps in, in, uh, in Costa Rica as we go. And again, so where, what do I like? Landscape, sunrise, sunsets and animals. And so here we go, a lot of landscapes, beautiful mountainsides. Oh my God, they were beautiful. And then of oh, course, how can you go to Costa Rica without trying to chase a hummingbird? like this little bug is trying to chase him, but he realized he probably didn't make it uh, as you go. So many different hummingbirds, 50 or some of there as well. I think in New Hampshire, we see three or four, Karen, you might know the answer, or um, some of my other hummingbird expert friends might know, but only a few varieties of hummingbirds that, that make their way, et cetera, and think about how many are there both the native ones that come through and how far they have to go and, and what they do um, in different kind of ways. I mean, just, you know, so beautiful. Um, obviously those that you need a really fast shutter spot, you need a tripod and a tripod person helping you. Oh my God. Shots. Um, and they're hard to do. You almost have to figure out where they're gonna go Right. I mean, it's like a lot of little birds. Karen's a very good uh, bird photographer. You got to figure out where they're headed one way or it's another. Not me sitting here. So. You know? Yeah. Somebody's got to, somebody might have to go to mute as we go. Uh, is it, How'd they get uh, on here? Somebody, we're hearing them in the background. I'm sitting here. There's no light behind me. And then, by the way, this, you know, um, one of the things I've often said, you know, um, I have a sense of humor for those of you who don't know me. And I've, I've, often said, I've often said that when I, when I die and come back, I want to come back as a birder, not a photographer. Because birders are happy seeing something through a scope that can show you something a mile away that looks really cool, an inch or whatever. And then they check, they even hear the 
birds sing, they check it off on a box and it's a really good day, especially it's a rare bird. A photographer is like, unless we get, go from documentation, which by the way, this to me is a documentation picture. It was so far away. I used every millimeter and you can see it's a little soft because there's not enough pixels left. But I think it is pretty cool to have seen a mile away this small little hummingbird, the size of your finger in a nest that you could, and, and how the guy finds it in the woods, I, I have no idea. By the way, you see, I couldn't get away with not telling the story. I love scarlet macaws, they're beautiful birds, different breeding season colors in different ways. The toucan, this is one of the other pictures in my head, going to Costa Rica to a rainforest. I wanna see one of those big birds like a toucan with rays of light coming through and whatever, and, we got fortunate enough to have that happen. And then two trips it took me to get the, uh, the Quetzal. This is kind of like the, the bird, like on the number one li list, like going to Africa and looking for the big five because you're, you know, the, repl the uh, res pleasant Quetzal, amazing. This was um, a male who the female had gotten killed who was bringing small avocados to the baby um, in the nest in that way, amazing. All right, and some of the birds, I just gotta go fast. I love the mot mots and I love saying it. Say that five times in a row, mot mot, mot mot. It just makes you feel good. They're just so beautiful, they're, they're, they're colors. And I love turquoise, Linda. That's one of my favorite colors in those eyes. I've got a pair. And then they have lots of trogons. And this is again, one of the different trogons, a different trogon. I gotta get better shots of these guys. They were far away and way up. These guys come a little closer. Look at that hood on that, on that tanager. Pretty amazing. One of the things that was so amazing on the coast up in the Northern Pacific at Coco was these pelicans. I think I used to call them when Mark and I would get up in the morning sunrise and, and go out and, and do it. It was like between the sunrise, the people fishing and the pelicans. I think I call, what did I call it? Air Force One, right, Mark? I think I called it Air Force One. We had like 30, 50 pelicans and they would wait till the light came up so they could see the fishermen. The locals were out there with a Coca-Cola can and a string and a hook like this, catching fish this big, unbelievable. And the pelicans would show up a little bit later and show them where to go. Pretty amazing, those brown pelicans. I call this a little bit to the left, you know, I got, got a good spot there, but maybe a little bit to the left, the massage could go on these orange fronted parakeets. Yeah, the, the best shots to me are interactions, relationships, pretty cool. Although a regular yellow naped parrot that lands when you're kind of ready to eat <laughs> and stuff on a, on a restaurant on the beach is a pretty cool thing. They also got mammals in Costa Rica. Remember, I love the big ones as well, the howlers, are the biggest when they howl and if they're close i get scared they are the loudest mammal on the planet we've been told by those who might know um, in that particular way and they're a group animal as you can see when the when our guide and we had a wonderful guide named uh, mo mauricio vasquez pizarro who took us through uh, the work there found these howler monkeys he goes how oh, this baby up there there's a baby up there it's before my eye surgery, by the way, and I could hardly see the little baby in the underneath the male, by the way, the mother's taking a nap. And there's a variety of other ones here, but that he said is about a, I think he said is about a four or five week old baby of the howler monkeys, howlers in the howler howling, a couple of juveniles. There are also Computian monkeys, gonna have to go a little faster given the time as we go. These guys look like they're ready for shul. Only some people will get that joke as we go. The white-faced Capuchin in between the two parents getting some protection. I took out all the gore and all the nursing shots for those of you, I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep it PG uh, as well. So the first trip I went to Costa Rica, I got two of the four uh, species, indigenous species. And the last time Mark and Amy and I went, we were able to get the squirrel and the spider monkeys uh, uh, up close, just gorgeous. And the spider monkey through the leaves and the trees, not the best of photographs, but sometimes you have to put up with trees in the foreground and far away things. Although the two buddies together uh, weren't too bad a shot. Got my best shot of a sloth. He's a happy man because you know why? 
there's a female up, up above him in the tree. He's on his way to see his female and that's mating season. Didn't show any of those. I don't think we got those. We did get the lions mating in Africa, but I didn't put that in the shot in the show today, I'm sorry to say. And at the end of Costa Rica, we had these beautiful sunrises. I'm gonna go through Africa quickly. I got a few more minutes. People willing to stay a couple minutes? Becca, it's really up to you. Can we go a few extra minutes and run through Africa? Absolutely. All right, good. And of course, anybody, the good news about a Zoom, it's not like doing a, a PD meeting with a staff, you know, where I know where they start packing up their books and they walk out of the back, you know, when it's the end of a staff meeting uh, in the old days or whatever, you can just go off Zoom anytime you want. So uh, as we go. So I was able to um, go to Africa this September into October to Kenya based on my friend Grace Preston's recommendation. Um, and so for those of you who might not have seen Africa and Kenya, you can see where it is. We basically landed at Nairobi, the big airport, and did puddle jumpers in what amounts to a triangle between the Mara, um, which is here right on the border of Tanzania, where the Great Migration occurs. And then we went to Amboseli because I'm a big elephant fan and wanted to make sure I could see the elephants in Kilimanjaro. We started off in the park in Kenya as well. Some of my better uh, uh, giraffe shots come from the beginning in the Nairobi Park. So I'm gonna go through, unless you have a lot of questions, this particular place is an amazing trust where they basically uh, get orphaned, mostly elephants, the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. Um, and they do amazing work with these baby elephants. They have a program, obviously you can see one of the keepers and these, this is not a show. These elephants are not trained to do this. They're playing with each other. And I just kind of showed it to you. And then they're, and they're released back in the woods, an amazing place in the elephants. So two places, once we got out of the, uh, the, air, the big airport location in Nairobi, we went to uh, the Masamara for the great migration. And this is, this is basically the Mara River um, where the migration, uh, the, uh, the wildebeest, the million plus, uh, you know, uh, a couple hundred thousand zebras, antelope, whatever, all come across the river. One of the great sunrises uh, in, in that way. If you're interested about where, again, we were in the Mara Triangle, um, right on the border of Tanzania, staying at the camp, which I'll show you in a moment as you go. And it, it is really an amazing place in that um, great migration. And so between the months of roughly June and uh, September-ish is when the peak coming into the Kenya side. The tour guides, which are great, called Wild Eye. I put this in and you can Google them if you're interested or contact me about them. Um, and the, the first week we stayed at a camp with the Wild Eye group, which is run by the, the Maasai, the local indigenous group. They're amazing. And my guides and Oh my goodness, I could talk for the whole hour on them. Just amazing to be a part of that. And so uh, a shout out um, to the Wild Eye Camp in Kishma. And Asante San means thank you very much um, in that way to our host, the commander, my guide, James, who is amazing, and the ladies who were uh, you know, running the kitchen and the rest of it as you go. And then we went to Amboseli, the national park, again, where the Kilimanjaro is and the elephants. And so again, another sun, sunrise in Amboseli. I'll take a breath. Any thoughts about Kenya or whatever before we go through the images? Anybody been, by the way, just to get whatever? Anybody uh, been, been to Kenya? No. All right, then I'm going to take you there. Another image of thoughts is always wondering about getting a mountain in the background. When I went to Rainier a while back, when Amy and I were there, they said, I think the average is one out of eight people see the mountain during the time they go to see Mount Rainier. You know, mountains bring their own weather to them. And from living in the Northwest and climbing, climbed to the top of Mount Hood when I was a young, young buck in the old days, um, you know that you may not get good weather. So we were just hoping that we would be able to get views of the mountain and then get animals in the mountain. And one of the most amazing mornings of my life to see this two males come across um, and with the three lionesses and all the cubs behind them cut across the mountain in the foreground so I could combine my love of landscape and wildlife um, in that particular way. And then we'll show you other lions as we go. The, the great Marani, the oldest oh, lion, lion in the piece. 
This is probably as gory as we get. They took down a hippo. If we had more time, I would tell you how rare it is for a lion. And it's a juvenile. And there's an amazing story to it. You'll have to stop me later. No, this is about as gory as it gets. Uh, it got gorier, but I, I, I'm not showing any of those. This was one lion usually does not take down even a juvenile hippopotamus. It's wild. Of course, the ladies are amazing. One of the lionesses, his lioness, and they're responsible for all kinds of things. She was in charge of being the last to eat the carcass and keeping the, the vultures away. So every once in a while, the vultures would come. She'd scare them away until eventually they, they went. Uh -huh. So yeah, so if you wanna, you know, we, the last day in Amboseli on the horn, right? The, the guy gets on the radio, there's two lions mating or whatever. And so she's like, let's go, let's go. And he's like going regular speed. And we go, why don't you go any faster? Because because when they're mating, they usually mate for a few days, he says. Oh, I said, yes, just like us humans. So we took our time and went across or whatever. And we get there and came upon them, the PG version uh, as we go. But there was, uh, there was some mating going on uh, in that way. But uh, just amazing to see the male and the female together and experience. This is going back to that morning across the mountain. So this to me was amazing. So the male split off and now you can see the two female lionesses leading. There's at least six kids. I'm not sure if the one in the back left is a third lioness or one a little older, you know, maybe, or another cub. When I saw these two lionesses, Mark and I together, we saw them usually with three cubs each, but got nine, nine lions in a picture, amazing. And then to me, this was like one of those epics she comes by with her three cubs, the wildebeest, like, you know, scattered. And now they're making a line behind her, basically saying thankful that they're going and they have full bellies, I guess, past the wildebeest with the beautiful trees in the background. Getting to see, you know, about one-year-old cubbies play, pretty cool. There was a big feast that morning with a wildebeest, two big lions, a few females and a bunch of year-old cubs. And then we're back to Amboseli. We had a lot of sleeping going on. And the, then the golden light, you know, my website, Chasing the Golden Light, I love the golden light, came on. Mom started waking up. When she woke up, the cubs were smart enough not to bother her until she woke up. And then they started coming over and snuggling. This is the youngest cub I was able to see and photograph, probably, um, according to our guide, out of the den, probably maybe for a week or two at most. She kept these far away under the palm trees as we go. What can you say about our leopard in the tree? Gorgeous animal. And look at the patterns in, in, the, uh, in the fur, pretty amazing. And this is where he, he came down and got close. I still am using not an iPhone at this point, but oh my goodness, he's closer than he looks, Steve. I know you're worried about me and worried about my insurance policy and all of that kind of stuff. And, and being my bankruptcy lawyer, I'm sure you're happy that I didn't get bit on the trip as we go. I'm glad you made it back. Yeah. And then what can you say when finally the, the, the cheetah uh, on the last day cuts across the savannah, ends up on a, on a little ledge, has a mountain behind it. I said to the chief driver, do you just like have this spot again? It's like a backdrop. Like I went to a store and said, okay, put the backdrop in green, a mountain-ish and blue in the background. Anyway, cheetahs, servals, and then perhaps the most stark picture of them all. The thing I like about most cats and most kills is they get you by the neck and you're gone. There's really no suffering and you still got eye to eye and a dead wildebeest as we go. Um, so to me, in some ways, one of the most powerful pictures, images of the trip, hopefully not too gory, but powerful of a story of life and death, two eyes going in different directions, uh, et cetera. In some ways, I think in some ways it might be, even though I love the beauty, <laughs> the beauty of this, uh, there's, there's a lot of power in this image, I don't know, for me. This image, you know, is just, you know, ribs. Um, in that particular way, the hyenas. We were able to see a black serval, very rare, and also way out one morning. Not only did we see it a mile away, and it's a little pixelated because there's not much of not much digital space left on that 
lack serval. You could still get a good picture for social media, but not for anything else. And then of course the jackal pup was very close um, as we go. Crossing the desert, the great, the great uh, dry desert. Every, every day, the elephants, the giraffes, they go across an embacelli. They make the trek every day to the lush lands where the meadows are and the waters are and the rest of it. And then they go back up at night as we go. Who doesn't love zebras and when they interact and cuddle or when you see a baby zebra? I didn't know, I didn't really realize that baby zebras start out as orangish brown um, as we go. And I was on a research project, Linda, you'd be happy to know, training yellow baboons to line up giraffes uh, in a line. And here I was fortunate enough, she was getting the giraffes lined up, fortunate enough to get a baby on the back across a river, by the way. This is across the Mara River. That's how far away this image is, of course, as we go. Sometimes the baby's closer underneath mom. Of course, you got to show one of the big five, the big buffaloes. They're, they're massive, but they're not as beautiful as other things. Hippos, you got to show at least the obligatory one. Uh, no dentists out there, but this guy could use a little work, I think. And I was fortunate enough of the big five to get one, maybe about a minute of a, of a, a black rhinoceros, unfortunately soon to be extinct, moving, moving away. There aren't too many left, unfortunately. We have to be so careful. That's why I love the Mara. I love this group because they're on the right side of where all the rules and regulations, they, again, we are impacting them. The Jeeps are impacting them. I'm not naive about that, but it, it is an amazing thing. All right, in your mind, photographs of elephants in front of Kilimanjaro. Okay, may not be the best because I had to pull out the sky and it's a little dusty, but man, just to be able to see that to see some of the big elephants. By the way, I came away with more of a love of elephants than anything else. Yes, I wanted that cheetah and leopard picture, but the ability to see these animals interact, the herds coming across, I think we got three, five, seven, eight, nine, I think we got 11. There's one really teeny little one, Kathy, littlest one right over there. I know you like little ones in that particular way. Here's a cool story. Elephants generally, I think you may or may not know, I wasn't really sure, they very rare to have twins. They basically have one. And when I interviewed some of the mother elephants, they say, if you carried around that kind of weight for 22 months, you wouldn't want to have more than one either, right? 22 months gestation period, exactly. So it's rare for them to have two. Two years ago, there was amazing rains and greens and food, and they had two sets of twins. Um, in Amboseli for the first time in 15 years, in 15 years. I don't know whether the second one survived, but we were fortunate enough to see this one. They told me that the guy, they call this one Anjo Lee. And so I was assuming that they might call the babies Brad and Pitt, but I'm not really sure about that. I am sure they call her Anjo Lee and it was good to see them, but so unique to see two babies. And then, you know, you try to get a silhouette. I'm not a good, I don't do silhouettes a lot. This is one of my first examples of it. I don't know, does it work? I always, I'm always not sure about silhouettes. It's beautiful. So we'll, I love we'll it. See, can at least see a little bit of the tusk. Oh, All right, the all river right, crossings. You hanging in with me for a couple more minutes? Everybody okay? Who needs to yep. be okay? Yes. The comfort of your home, you got bathrooms, you got drinks, you got everything you need. All right, Beautiful. listen, the river crossing. Most people go, of course, you want to see lions and, and leopards and whatever. People go for the migration across the river of these thousands of things. This is, I think, a nine shot pano. All of those little things all the way around, those are thousands of wildebeest gathering to come to the river's edge to get up the courage or to be hot enough or to be spooked enough by somebody behind you pushing too close to go off the edge and cross the river and hope the crocodile doesn't get you, right? And so a lot of times they, and there's chaos and there's a lot of times they go down to the water. The zebras are there first. The zebras often spot the crocs. It's this time they said it was a false alarm. They go all the way down. They gotta go all the way up as we go. 
I decided to go a little Escherish on this one, make it a black and white, um, and to show the chaos. So much of this is chaos for these poor animals going across the scene. So I went black and white on this. I went black and white on this one too, but not, not as extreme as the other one to show them in the water, you know, cutting across. If you like, the school teacher in me likes orderly. And so if you take that wide angle lens, and I wanted people and myself to be able to see the whole scene now um, in almost what it might look like to the naked eye. And you can see the buildup on the far edge. You can see them coming down in at least three different shoots to come across and then they split across. And it does look somewhat orderly across in that particular way. In this one, you can see that, and a giraffe shall lead them, a giraffe going across and an orderly line on a different crossing. The crocodiles are these two little blurbs on the bottom. I'm not sure if you could see my cursor. If you can, on the, on the bottom right, there's a couple blurbs. Those are the crocodiles that didn't make it to the party, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the hippos are, are going away in the middle of the picture on the right. And then a little close-ups. The zebra's cutting across. Fortunately, we didn't see what lots of people want to see is too much, too much uh, death on the trips. They sometimes come across and look like they're just trying to jump. I love it when they jump in the air, like the one on the bottom, and there's really nowhere, no reason to jump up at that moment. You're already at the shoreline, but it makes for a good picture. Also love eagles in Africa too. Fish eagles look like our bald, but maybe even a little bit prettier if I could say that blasphemy with their orange and brown in the middle. We saw different types of eagles. You saw the battleers before, the, the tawnies and the long crested, beautiful. Maybe the prettiest bird in Africa in terms of neck up something. and the rest of it. Look at that gray crowned crane, gorgeous eyes, whatever. Wanted this shot too, when you know there's thousands of flamingos around and they're in the waters in Amboseli, you're looking for a good takeoff. And then one of the prettiest birds around, the lilac breasted roller. By the way, I was told to go back and watch uh, the Lion King after I got back. And it's so cool how all of these things look like the pictures and there's lilac rollers in there. I don't know if they're little beaters, they're really pretty. I know where, where women might've got their idea for eye makeup. Uh, from a long time ago, perhaps uh, in these ways, or even men these days for eye makeup. Everybody's got to find a secretary bird, although I'm sure PC these days, you might have to call it the administrative assistant bird, but got some good eye makeup on, uh, on this bird too. Red eye, love it. This was a beautiful bird that we saw, love that tail. Saw some kingfishers, got some interactions three big kingfishers in Costa Rica, an ibis, an ostrich kind of uh, trying to entice something and a white belly go away bird. All right, I think that's, that's where we are in terms of there, a good night, Amboseli. Any responses or thoughts or anybody have your, your list of a couple that you like before we send us all into the into the night. Howard? Yes. I knew you were a great teacher, but you're a phenomenal entertainer. <laughs> There's I so think much we... information I learned, but I enjoyed it so much. You are just a, a, such a phenomenal photographer and sharing these images has been a real treat. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure thank that you. there's, thank I'm sure you so there's, much. I'm sure there's two sides to my jokes. The same amount of people who don't like them have heard them eight times already. Believe me, as as we go, yeah. Well, you know, these days you have to merge things. I think the beauty is, a lot of times I've been told that that men have trouble going into retirement, and I just think you need something to be passionate about. And so for me to combine the wildlife, the photography, the outdoors, that that and be able to get Amy out there. And it looks like Roland has actually already sketched a little bit of the, of the bird already as we I'm go. I'm glad you can see it. I wanted oh, to show it to cool. you. 
Yes, I can. I can. My favorite is the gray crown crane for sure. Of course. I mean, there's so much beauty and detail in that neck and each of those individual feathers on the head are unbelievable. I love turquoise too. Turquoise. Uh, actually, uh, it's a, that, that is turquoise, though your picture was a little bit more blue, but I have a limited number of watercolor pencils. So I, I didn't want to make too much of a mess since I only had such a <laughs> short time. <laughs> Cool. Anybody else want to jump in on on something, uh, an image they liked? Hi, Howard. This is Susan. Hi, Susan. How are you tonight? I'm good tonight. It's a great show. Really wonderful show. I love this. Um, this final picture here. It's beautiful. Um, you know, I'm so partial to your snowies. I, I just love the snowy owls, but I think my favorite picture, even though they're all stunning, particularly the Africa ones, I think it's the owlets, those four owlets. I love those. Oh, the, yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to slide through to that picture in a moment um, just to share, you know, what's funny about that picture. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can just get it to you to see it bigger for a second. Are you seeing it full screen again? Look at that. Yes, yeah. yes. So to me, to me, that's not, you know, again, it it it's not perfectly exposed. It's really tough to get them underneath the light. They're backlit. So it, it you know, it's the power of four together take care of the ills of the picture, I guess. I mean, to me, I'm a perfectionist, unfortunately. I see the blur in the bottom right, you know, in that way. And I go, hey, if it was only an inch more, I could have cut out that and it wouldn't be so, I look at that, I get a little distracted, but the power of it, it's by the way, it's one of the cards I have in Serendipity in Milford and they're always selling out. I said, why don't you just tell the person to buy a box? It would be cheaper <laughs> for them to do that, that, that particular way. So thank you. All right, so we got four of a kind. Well, I, you know what, that was my favorite as well. Four of a kind. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Anybody else? Oh, well, Howard, this is Mark. I I really love the uh, the red fox that was adoring the father. Yes. yes. As you being know, I have six children. I was going to say, being a father of six, you probably can speak to this one, huh? Uh, I just never, I don't th think that any of my children, not certainly never looked at me like that, but the feeling behind it would be wonderful as well. Yeah. Um, but you know how kids are with their dads. Very tough. Very yeah, tough. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah so well, that, so sure. seeing that red fox and getting the adoration uh, to the father was just, it, it's, I got the chills, just the, yeah. the emotion of it. Yeah. So and that's, that's a wonderful photo. Yeah, and there's an example. To me, again, this is one of my favorites because it's emotional. And it all obviously, I'm sure your kids have looked at you that way before. Or the good news about your kids, unlike this fox kid, this dad only has a limited amount of time to get some love from this to the to the dad, because you know, in a few months, this kit will be hunting on its own, have to find its own territory, whatever you have got, thankfully, years. And when we go to Costa Rica in a couple of weeks together with both of our sons, people uh, might be hearing that the first time, Amy is blessing us and is going to have some peace around here with both of her boys away. I'm sure you'll get an adoring look at that time. But, but the other part about this picture too is, is I don't care how adoring the baby is, dad is understanding what his role is here right now too, right? Dad's role is to make sure to protect this kit not to look back lovingly at this moment. Now, some of you might be asking, do you have a kid of the dad looking at the baby? And the answer is, I do. But in some ways, I like this one because I like the eye contact with the dad through the lens as well. So yeah, so this is one of my favorites. And it did win uh, People's Choice at right at Beaverbrook, uh, Amy, right, right sweetie? Yeah. Um, yeah, it won People's Choice uh, at, at one of the local shows recently, was voted in as, the, as their choice and and because it, it has emotional meaning. Uh, and by the way, it does, doesn't, hurt, doesn't hurt to have those eyes looking at you and the baby having a turquoise eye, light, light blue, not turquoise, but powder blue, doesn't hurt, right, in that way. All right, one more. I think we have time for one more. Then we got to send people to bed because some of you have been working a long time today, including the rest of us. Is there one more that anybody wants to highlight? 
or any questions about Africa or anything else before we say thank you to the Jaffrey Civic Center, to my mentor uh, as well, because I wouldn't be the teacher I am without your influence and Warren's influence. And I'm going to get through that without getting emotional. Do you need thank to say, you. do you need to say goodbye to, to people and wish them uh, well, Becca? Well, I was, I was just going to tell you my favorite. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. Go ahead. Really like the, the black bear um, with the stormy sky behind it. Black um, bear and storm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that like what you were saying is it, it kind of speaks to the viewer. There's, there's, there is definitely a story behind it and there's an, an emotive quality. And I think that's like where a lot of your work is, is really strong and it really, it really reaches people because, because there, there is this quality of this feeling that this bear has that, um, that a person that's looking at it can relate to. And, and, and I like that. And also as a painter, I've noticed a lot in my works, I, I paint um, people, from the back. I paint a lot of backs because you can't see their face and you can kind of identify with those people in my painting. So I so I, I, I identify with the bear in your painting very much. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I, and I do think, again, it, you know, if my work has that element to it, it's because because that that I'm relationship oriented and a teacher at first in that sense. So to me, I'm looking for the social emotional learning. In fact, I'm I'm hoping to get some uh, some help uh, and maybe when I'm still not working in any schools anymore um, to maybe do some children's books um, on social emotional learning though, a particular focus around the interactions, the relationships uh, and the skill sets. I know as a teacher and a father, I know I learn more about their behavior and that helps me be a better photographer. I look for their behavior, try to understand their habitat and that's one of the ways to get better wildlife pictures. Um, you also got to get up early if you want to be a landscape photographer, particularly, uh, you know, in the summer. You got to be up at 2 a.m. Good night, everyone. Thanks again for showing up. Good to see those of you who I know for long times and those of you who I live with and those of you who I love and some new people. If anybody's around locally and want to get to the gallery, it's very widely spaced. You can be in there easily. And if it's a weekend and I'm around, I might even be able to give you a tour. Stay well, everybody. Stay safe. Thank stay you so much, Howard. Well. Thank you, Howard. Stay Thank you. Thank you. Howard. Hi, Amy. Thank you very much. Only together we beat everything. Bye.